down projected on the screen or you may want to read it in the Bible you brought or on your iPad or iPhone or other kind of electronic device. It is so powerful and wonderful today that Scripture can be available to us in so many ways. The book of Matthew, the sixth chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, as earth on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I would simply like to take a moment to share with you that those who have not had the opportunity of being in all three worship services, I think we had, was it a total of five children in youth choirs today who sang? Five children and youth choirs of this church. That doesn't just happen. That represents a lot of time and energy and commitment on the part of the students, on the part of parents, on the part of staff, and on the generosity of this congregation that allows that to happen. Music is such a powerful way in which we learn about God and one another, the stories of our faith, and what it means to be together. So I would simply like to say for our music staff, for our parents, for our students, thank you so much for the gift you have given us. I would also like to take just this moment of privilege to remind you about the prayer quilts. These prayer quilts are powerful expressions of the love of the church that comes to people in times of sickness and in times of great need. And it is incredible comforting for people to have those. I cannot tell you how many times I have visited in homes or visited in hospitals, and those quilts are so prominent oftentimes upon the the legs of the person are wrapped in them. It is a way of wrapping people in prayer. And I hope you will come forward and pray this day and tie a knot in each and every one of these, for these people are in need of your prayer. But I would also like to remind you that prayer quilts don't just mysteriously appear. Uh, I guarantee you, you don't go out and buy these quilts. These quilts come as a labor of love of people within this church who have had an ongoing ministry for many years of creating these quilts. And I do mean creating, not just making, but creating these quilts and offering them to others as a gift of love. We were very blessed this last uh, week uh, that for three days we hosted the quilt guild that had its beginning in this congregation and grew beyond this congregation so that this kind of ministry could spread to other churches and other lives could be touched. And they will not like that I'm doing this. But those of you who are involved with the prayer quilt ministry, would you please stand that we might recognize you? Please. I see you out there. I know some of you. <laughs> God touches our lives in many ways, and we give thanks for the way in which this ministry lifts and upholds so many people in times of need. Well, I want to tell you a story. It's a story about a pastor who joined the church of a relatively prestigious and large church. And 
whenever you bring someone new on staff, you look for the ways that you kind of easily introduce them to the congregation, but you also don't want them to do something, you know, that kind of screws things up. Have you ever started a new job or been someplace like that? You don't want that to happen. So they decided that the new pastor, that they would have him be the liturgist for a Sunday. What kind of trouble can you get into as a liturgist, right? And then he was told, what we want you to do is to lead the congregation in the Lord's Prayer. That is a slam dunk. He had been praying the Lord's Prayer since early in his childhood. He had been leading congregations in the Lord's Prayer for years. What could be a better way to establish himself with credibility and authority than to lead in the Lord's Prayer? So the time came in the service to lead the Lord's Prayer, and he got up and began the Lord's Prayer, and about a third of the way through went totally blank. And so the last part of the Lord's Prayer was more like, <laughs> fortunately, the congregation carried it along. But he went back, he sat down, he pulled out a piece of paper, the sweat was pouring off his forehead, and he began rapidly writing that prayer out. How could he not have known it? And he got up at the next service and got about two-thirds of the way through and screwed it up again. This is Nancy Andrus is laughing over here. The third time he got up to do the Lord's Prayer, and this time, by the grace of God, he was able to make his way through it. However, by that time, he was soaked in sweat. He was sure that his ministry had come to an end before it had even begun. But given the grace and the love of this staff, they stopped mentioning it to me after about six weeks. And so then a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Charles says, well, you know, Lorinda's going to be out of town and I'm going to be on the North Campus. Would you like to preach on the South Campus? And I said, absolutely. What are we going to be doing? <laughs> and the smile was just so wonderful. Oh, we're doing the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. God works in mysterious ways. The Lord's Prayer is an incredible gift of God and Jesus into the life of the church. It's kind of the Jesus model for preaching. It's the Jesus model for praying. It is a prayer that really was probably not intended to be prayed the way that we do it, and oftentimes it becomes such a rote part of our experience that we might miss the gift that it is. But the Lord's Prayer really is a model or a framework that Jesus offered his disciples at a very particular time in their lives and their ministries, and it's helpful for us to understand that. The ministry of Jesus was gathering steam, if you will, more and more people were coming to hear him. More and more people were asking of him. And if not by intent, certainly by default, more and more people were beginning to ask things of the disciples. And it was in this experience of being called upon more and more that the disciples came to Jesus and ask him, teach us to pray. For they had watched the ministry of Jesus as it had grown and developed. They had come to know this man in an intimate way, and they knew that that which connected him with such depth to the Father was his life of prayer his willingness to step away from the busyness of life, the demands that people made upon him, and to ground himself in prayer.
And so they simply ask, teach us, teach us to pray because they wanted that connection also. They wanted that relationship. And this prayer is a model for that. It's not the magic prayer. It's the prayer that helps us structure the way in which we think about and experience our relationship with God and with his world, with his coming kingdom, and with all of creation. Lord, teach us to pray. You know, it's a very short prayer, <laughs> if you remember it and do it right. Uh, only 57 words, if you're happening to read it in Greek. Six sentences said slowly. It only takes about 30 seconds. And yet, it is the model for praying that brings us into relationship with God. It grounds us experientially in God's love. Do you remember the, the sermon in the past or the scripture that talked about what is the greatest commandment? The Lord your God is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and yourself and your neighbor and the commandment is to love. The invitation is to relationship. The power comes from knowing God and God's presence. And the most powerful way we have in our lives to do that is through prayer. You may note that the creeds of the church begin with the phrase, I believe. The prayers of Jesus begin with Father. Father, a statement of relationship, a statement of connectedness. Now, some of us obviously have not had the relationship with the fathers that we would want to use as the models for the relationship when we call upon God as Father, but we don't want to be trapped in our small gods or our small thinking about gods. We want to be able to expand that understanding that our Father, Father, is an endearment. It's a very unique relationship. It is grounded first and foremost in love and the acceptance that love's, love brings to us. But it's also important to note that Jesus did not teach them to pray, my Father, but our Father. And in that very intentional choice of words was conveyed once again that it is not simply about us. The emphasis upon individual salvation is a relatively new emphasis in the history of Christianity. From our Judeo tradition, uh, the emphasis is on the salvation of the community, of the people. And in the very beginning of this prayer, that is what we are introduced to once again. If you pray, our Father, and if you allow yourself to use that model to step back and reflect, you cannot help but be introduced to all of God's creation, that all of the people who have walked this earth and will walk this earth are his children and our brothers and sisters. Now, they may be brothers and sisters who have different faith traditions, but that makes them our brothers and sisters no less. For the prayer that Jesus taught was a prayer of inclusion, a prayer that gathered together all of that which God has created and proclaimed good. Our Father who art in heaven, we like to believe that heaven is somehow different from here. 
rather than an expression perhaps of what here is. And therefore we oftentimes get caught up in believing that that kingdom which is to come is somehow going to miraculously or magically just appear. And that we play no role in that whatsoever. But I think Jesus reminded us in the prayer that the kingdom is not only for us, the kingdom is for all, and we in this day and time play an important role in its creation. And so as we pray the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, one is encouraged to ask, and what will that kingdom look like? What is my role within it? And am I choosing to live fully in a way that creates that kingdom as much as possible in this moment? Not far off there. In this moment, do we as disciples of Jesus live in a way to create his kingdom? Thy will be done. You know, I'm not always real sure what I want or what I'm about. So it's helpful to be reminded ever so often that there is that allegiance that is greater than mine, that it's God's will. And to reflect on that and to ask about that, to think about that in quietness of given who I am as an individual this day, what is God's will? What would God have me be about? Not my will, but God's will. And how can I make that part of the living reality of my life? And then he does something very, very unique. Give us this day our daily bread. Did you note, he did not say, uh, give me a six month supply. He did not say, guarantee me forever. He said, simply ask of God that you might recognize that what you need to be fed, to be sustained, to be nourished is given us on a daily basis. And what we receive in that day is sufficient. And that is for what we ask. Now, it has been my experience that many, many people live their lives incredibly in the past or incredibly in the future, and sometimes both. We oftentimes live incredibly in the past when there was something about the past that was so wonderful and joyous, we never want to lose it and we try to grasp it and hold on to it. More often, however, we live in the past with our hurts, with those times in which we feel we have been betrayed or things have not been fair and we ruminate on those and we go back to them time and again, not necessarily to learn from them so we can live differently, but to kind of hold on to them as a badge of honor that says life is not fair and we want it changed. Lots of luck with that. Or we live in the future in a way that we are so busy planning and hoping for and wondering what is coming and trying to control and trying to create. And that's not all bad, but if we live too much in the future or too much in the past, we miss that experience of daily bread. We miss the moment, the presence that God has given us as gift. And so Jesus reminds his disciples that when they would pray, that they would pray for the presence of what is taking place this day. Give us this day. And then, you know, I don't know if it's intentional or if he just likes to slide it in kind of there, but with a smile on his face, he does that forgiveness thing. How many of us 
have not hungered for forgiveness? How many of us have lived our lives in such a way that we've never felt that sense of needing to confess and needing to know that a loving person reaches down and touches us and says, I forgive. What more powerful gift is there than the gift of forgiveness when we know we have gone astray and yet Christ calls us and God calls us and offers us that forgiveness with the reminder that then we must learn to forgive others. I am so much better at critiquing the faults of others than I am at forgiving them. And that's part of being human. And yet, what Jesus offers us in this model of prayer is the reminder that forgiveness is available to us and that we can be the conduit of forgiveness for others. We have been blessed and empowered with the ability to forgive. We all get trespassed upon, we all have debts, we all stand in need of that which wipes the slate clean and empowers us in love to live in the fullness of Christ. There were a couple of warnings also in the prayer, reminders to the disciples, for Jesus knew what their lives were to be to remind them of temptation that would be there, to remind them of the reality of evil. If you do not believe that there are temptations in this world and if you do not believe that evil abounds, you are not, let's see, I guess the word would be cognizant or something, but you're not in touch with reality because evil does exist and temptations abound. And the response in the prayer is simply, it's a reality. And that our prayers are that we might not be tempted or that we not, might not succumb, that we might recognize evil for what it is and that it is not part of God's plan or kingdom. And that in the living of our kingdoms, we find the ways to address that, to try to make it better, to try to change it, to not bow down to evil. Prayer, prayers of this type change our hearts and they prepare us for reading and understanding God's word. I would like to share with you a writing from one of my favorite authors, Richard Rohr. Richard Rohr uh, is a Franciscan priest uh, who has written about 30 books uh, and he lectures and he does all of these things and if you ever had the opportunity to sit with Richard, he is one of the most gentle, open, warm, caring, non-pretentious people you could ever meet. And he is a man of incredible and deep prayer. But Richard says this about prayer and reading scripture. We can only safely read scripture, for it is a dangerous book, if we are somehow sharing in the divine gaze of love. A life of prayer helps you develop a third eye that can read between the lines and find the golden thread which is moving towards inclusivity, mercy, and justice themes that are so intricately woven throughout our Judeo-Christian heritage. Inclusivity, mercy, and justice. I am sure that it is what Paul means when he teaches that we must know spiritual things in a spiritual way. That's out of 1 Corinthians 2, 13. And then he goes on to say, any pre-existing condition of a hardened heart, a predisposition to judgment, a fear of God, 
Any need to win or prove yourself right will corrupt and distort the most inspired and inspiring of Scripture. Just as they pollute every human conversation and relationship, hateful people will find hateful verses to confirm their love of death. Loving people will find loving verses to call them into an even greater love of life. And both kinds of verses are in the Bible. It is one of the reasons why this model of prayer is so incredibly important that during those times in which our hearts are hardened and all of us have our hearts hardened from time to time, that through prayer our hearts might be softened. That when we get caught up in our sense of ego and needing to be important, that we can come and find our place once again with humility and grace in God's presence and as God's people. This is a prayer grounded in love. It is a prayer grounded in relationship. Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Now, as you all know, we are in the period of Lent. Lent is oftentimes a time in which many people choose not to come to church. They choose not to come to church because for many people, Lent is synonymous with depression and sadness and solemnity and a sense of how incredibly wicked we are, which can be true. But that's not what Lent is about. Lent is a time for joyful celebration. Lent is a time in which we can say, because we know the end of the story, Lent is the time in which we can say, just as I am, I can come, and God embraces me, and loves me, and transforms me in new and wondrous and powerful ways. And when I live out of that transformation, I'm part of what transforms the world. I'm part of what ushers in God's kingdom on earth. And so I would like for you to be playful with this model of prayer throughout the season of Lent I would like you to read this prayer with a sense of joy and with a sense of expectation. I would like for you to feel the wonder <clears throat> that comes when one is loved so deeply and knows it. And so in a moment, I'm going to ask you to join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. And I would ask you to be mindful of how you do that because, you know, typically when we say, now we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer, everybody's head drops on their chest and they kind of pull in and, you know, there's this, there is this sense of, of almost hiding in the praying of this prayer. Well, there's another way to pray it. And that is to pray it with your head up looking to the heavens. It is a way of praying it with a sense of incredible gratitude and thanksgiving. It is a way of praying it with a knowledge, the knowledge that God encompasses us in his love. And so I'm going to invite you to join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. It will be on the screen. I wrote it out for myself before the service. You just never know what's going to happen. But I invite you to know that joy with which God gave this prayer to his disciples, that you as his disciples might also have it. Please join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.